and welcome to this webinar, Rehoming Programs and How Thinking Outside Your Shelter Increases Your Impact and Keeps Your Staff Safe. I'm your moderator and host, Mandy Evans. I'm the Executive Director of the Home to Home Program and the Panhandle Animal Shelter. Our Home to Home Program started in 2016 and now is in 17 shelters throughout the nation. But what's more exciting? Today, I'm joined by Marin Humane, and they're going to be sharing about their rehoming program. Welcome, Carrie and Karina. Hi, everyone. Oh, uh, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Can you um, give us your name and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Carrie Fennell. I am the director of shelter services, um, otherwise known as shelter operations at Marin Humane. I've been there for about 16 years. We are in Marin County, California, which is about 20 minutes from San Francisco. And Karina, can you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Karina Devera. I'm the digital marketing specialist at Marine Humane. I've been there for just over two years and I implemented the No Place Like Home program on the website and I'll talk a little bit about how that worked. Awesome. Okay, so today what our goal is, is to share um, how a rehoming program is possible at your shelter and give you a little bit of feedback and information on how it's been successful for us. So we're going to dive right in and ask some questions. So Carrie, this was my understanding was your brainchild and I'm wondering what was the driving force? Like why did you see a need in your community to start this program? And was there any specific reasons why you started it? Yeah, so we were looking at ways, as many shelters are now, to keep animals out of the shelter. I mean, that's really our goal. I know it sounds counterproductive, but really we want to keep animals out. Um, and so we were, I was looking at ways to do that, and we came up with kind of a four-prong approach. The first one was to offer people um, assistance if they need help with medical um, care of their animal. Oops, oops, excuse me. The next one is to look at ways if they need help with behavior. Um, and then the, the third prong was about how to help people rehome their animal without having to bring um, the animal to the shelter. And then the last prong was um, how we take in surrendered animals. But we really were just looking for an avenue to keep people um, from having to surrender their animal directly to the shelter so that we could use our space for truly the animals that have no other option. Perfect. And did, so I know for us, when we launched our program, it, I was really, I kind of freaked out a little bit because I'm thinking, how is the community going to are they going to accept this? Like, what are they going to think? Are they going to think we're promoting people rehoming their pets? Um, can you tell me a little bit about how your community responded to the program? Well, so for years, we had this binder um, behind our adoption desk that was similar. It was a private rehoming binder that nobody looked at. Nobody even remembered it was there. Um, and so I, I, you know, I wasn't actually as concerned about how the community would be um, because there are so many um, different avenues for placement, pet finder, even people sometimes post animals on Craigslist. I was more concerned on how we could manage it. Was, was there gonna be this, was it gonna become the next pet finder um, so that people were posting animals from out of state? And, and that really wasn't the purpose, it was supposed to be local. Um, so that was really more my concern than the community's um, worry about it. And how did the community feel when you, what, did you get responses? They love it. I mean, they really, really love it. Um, I really go from the mantra of just trying things out. Um, you know, you look at what the worst case scenario is. And um, so I was, I was pleasantly surprised, though, how many people think it's such a great program. When we would post it on Facebook, people were so appreciative. Um, and the support was great. And the staff love it, too, because this is one more tool that they can give the public when they call us or when they ask for assistance with rehoming. Instead of saying, no, we're too full, or no, we can't take your animal, um, or yes, just bring your animal in, this is one more avenue for that. 
So I know in our conversations when we're talking to shelters throughout uh, the country that are interested in starting a rehoming program, one of their main concerns is how the staff will, will um, bond to this program or take this program on. And I know that there were two main issues that our staff had when we did it locally was how will this impact our adoptions of the in-house animals? And also, can we really trust our community? So can you talk a little bit about how your team kind of embraced the program and if they had the same concerns and what the outcomes were? Yeah, I mean, there always is a lot of talk about competition within this field, um, that there's just, there's this opinion that there's, there's only this limited amount of homes for this large amount of animals. And actually we're seeing um, right now with what's going on that that may not actually be the case. So many people are wanting to adopt and to take fosters in. Um, but that was a little bit of a concern because especially for us, we decided to put these animals um, right next to our adoptable animals on our website. And there was discussion, are we competing with, with our animals? Um, how we justified it, and I think I know why, how we're all very comfortable with it, is these animals would end up being surrendered to our shelter. And this way we can help even more animals because if those animals don't come in, we have space for more animals. And, and that really has um, resonated with everybody and people, they agree with that and, and they see the positive outcomes because of it. Awesome. And we experienced the same thing. I mean, it actually increased our adoptions because our, it just helped the awareness. But what about um, the concern about trusting your community? So, so there was concern about that, about trusting the public. Um, is the adopter um, being honest? Is the person trying to rehome the animal being honest um, about it? Are they not disclosing certain things? Um, and that was a concern, but it was not, it, we have not had that validated. Um, because I think if anything, they're getting more information because you're having that one-on-one -on -one communication. I mean, how many times have we done an adoption where the adopter had said, oh, I wish I could talk to the, uh, the, the person mm -hmm. who surrendered the animal or vice versa. How many times have the person who surrendered an animal said, please give my number out and my information if the adopter ever wants to talk. And so we, we do that. I mean, we, we put that, those together. Yeah, I think there's a false sense of security and the idea that a shelter is going to be doing all of this due diligence, but you know, we're literally taking it off of a what one sheet, two sheeter from yep. an owner and basing the entire uh, personality and behavior on an animal based on the behavior we see in a shelter. And frankly, I believe they did a study that shows that the behavior in a shelter doesn't translate to the behavior in a home and vice versa. So this direct communication and we've been doing the program since 2016 and we've had literally no issues. So it's people need to just go, we can do this. And I think the more that you put your faith and trust in your community, the more they step up and help. I, I agree with you, you so much. I mean, also look at stray animals. When a stray animal comes in and ends up on the adoption floor, we have no history for that animal. Right. Let's move on and talk about um, the benefits. When you have a rehoming program, there are three parties really that benefit from the program. There's the pet guardian, there's the potential adopter, and there's the shelter. So let's start with the benefits to the pet guardian. Yeah, um, for the pet guardian, there's a lot of unknowns of kind of what occurs when their animal gets um, surrendered. And I, I do know that they feel this lack of control over it. Um, and so by them being able to do this, we call it no place like home, but this rehoming program, they're able to have um, a voice and be part of the process. And they know the animal best about better than anyone else would. Perfect. Yeah, it's really empowering. I don't. I feel like it makes them feel really good. It. Because it, it, yes. it, I don't know about you guys, but I find that most people that are surrendering, they're surrendering actually to benefit the animal, not themselves. And I think that people get a bad. A, there's a lot of bad um, shaming around mm -hmm. owner surrenders. But we're talking about like I had a situation where an elderly couple had this really active dog. And they just didn't think it was fair and they found a really great home for the dog 
Um, so it does give it allows people to be able to make that difficult decision and feel good about it rather yeah. than um, feel sad. Okay, so then what about what's the benefits to the potential adopter? Well, for the potential adopter, they get a lot more information about the animal, um, more than they would from, from if they adopted it directly from the shelter. Uh, and so that is just, you know, that's huge. Could you imagine having that? It's, you know, they right there, they can answer um, get answers to all their questions. Okay, so what about the shelter? So shelters have limited space. Um, if we can have another outlet for these animals, that means we can help those animals that truly have no other option. Um, the stray animals that don't get redeemed. Um, and, and it's best for everybody. And um, for us, we, I don't know if you guys tracked your year over year owner surrenders, but the first year that we had the program, we saw a 31% decrease in our owner surrenders to our shelter. Um, and then through the network, we see a 25% uh, reduction in owner surrenders. And later on, I have a slide that demonstrates how that looks in um, dollars to the, to the organization in, in savings. That's amazing. That's, that's really amazing. So right now in animal welfare, everybody I think that's watching will recognize that there's a huge push for shelters to be more focused on being a community resource than, you know, taking all the animals in. It's mm -hmm. managed intake. It's exactly what you talked about with all the programs that you're offering to help community members keep their pets. How do you feel like, how do you feel that a, um, about the rehoming program and how shelters really can benefit by offering this to their community? Well, the first thing I want to kind of make it clear <clears throat> to shelters is this program is so easy. Um, it is really, really easy. And please put your fears, you know, off to the side and at least try it. Um, and so it, it benefits everybody. It benefits the shelter, it benefits the animals, um, and it's a really easy process. I know that there's different ways different shelters have rolled this out. I know you're going to talk about how you did it and we're going to talk about how I did it, but it's, it's a real simple um, program to roll out and it benefits everybody. Yeah, it's like another way of living out your mission, really. It is, for um, sure. For sure. And I mean, let's be honest, we're in the middle of a pandemic where shelters are closed and really leadership has to be careful about protecting their staff. Offering a program like this serves your mission and really keeps your staff safe. Exactly, exactly, yep. Okay, so let's see, you, I wanna hear about your results. So you guys have some amazing data yeah. and you, um, have been running this program for, well, one full year last year, yep. right? And yes. then part of this year. Yes. So tell us about the data. What have you guys been seeing? Well, we saw so far we posted close to a little bit over 180 animals, I think. I think it was 181 animals. So we've posted about 181 animals, like I said. Um, of those animals, I think this is the number that's really important percentage-wise. Of those animals, only 15% ended up coming into a shelter, to either our shelter or a rescue group. You know, that means if I do my math right, that's 85% of those animals did not have to put their, did not have to enter the shelter. And that is, that's an amazing number. Um, we found about, you know, 60% of those were en ended up being rehomed privately. Some 11% uh, of people ended up keeping the animal. And what we've been doing with our program, we were very lucky. We did get a grant through Maddie's Fund. And so we have a staff person who will actually reach out to each person who's posting just to make sure, um, is there any kind of service that they need. So I think that has added to the 11% of people keeping their animal because sometimes it was a medical issue they needed help with or a behavior issue. So it's been a wonderful program. I think it's great. It's one of the reasons that I'm a big um, supporter of programs like this is because as, as technology grows, there tends to be a theme 
towards making it easy. Like everything needs to be easy. The problem is that it takes out the human connection. And really in what we do is our job is to be really influencing our community in the way that we want them to care for, our pet, for their pets. Um, and how do you do that if you don't have conversations with your community? Yes, initially we just weren't able to kind of keep up with that, but with this grant we have been able to. So initially what would happen is they would just be emailed to us and we would, you know, read them and sometimes tighten them up a little bit um, and just make sure everything, you know, looked good. But now we're able to do that extra step, which is huge by personally calling them and say, you know, we, oh, the other question we're asking people that I think is important when we call them is we ask them what is their time frame, meaning at what like how long can they hold on to the animal because that that helps us and 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 kind of prioritizing what's important because some people will say you know I can hold on to my animal until I find that perfect match or other people may say something like I you know I'm moving out of the country and I, I need to find something within a month and so that just helps us and gives us more information to help them. Nice okay um so you just answered my next question oh. i was going to ask you if it's hard to manage um that we i think agree that it's a minimal time commitment um so our program locally has seen a 22 percent increase since we made the change to closing our doors and wondering if you guys have seen the same spike in um rehoming now that you aren't completely open to helping people in the yeah, shelter that's a good question. And to be honest, I don't know the answer. I haven't. Um, uh, Karina can probably answer that better because she'll see what's coming through. Um, this is a new thing. So I think as the um, the shelter in place expands I, and it likely will be longer, I think we will definitely see an up, upswing, but I don't know if that's happened yet. Okay. Well, Karina, you're, you're live, so do you have anything you wanna to add to that? It doesn't look like it's had a huge spike yet, um, but I do think, like Carrie said, it will continue to grow. We're definitely seeing the submissions. We're seeing the page views on the animals listed for private rehoming definitely go up. Um, we'll just have to see how the overall activity um, pans out over the next weeks, maybe months. Perfect. And it's amazing because you guys already have the program in place. So it's great that people know it's a, there's a resource there. So we all agree that everyone in the nation should have a rehoming site. And I know that Karina has some really great information on telling people how you can create a rehoming site on your own at your shelter. So why don't we move into to that? Karina, what do you what do you think? What do people need to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so running your own program definitely has a number of um, advantages. You have a lot of control over what it looks like. You have a lot of flexibility and um, your branding will also be all over the place. So that means you get to decide what it looks like, where to put it, all that kind of good stuff. So for example, on Marine's, our Marine Humane's website, you really can't miss it. Um, we have links and references to our rehoming program all over the place, including our adoptions pages. Um, those are, of course, our pages that get the most traffic. And then other places where it would just make sense under get help, under the can't keep your pet headers. Um, it's very easy to find. The key component of this whole program is the profile submission form, um, where basically folks fill out a bunch of questions and then submit the profile of their pet for rehoming. We use a WordPress plugin called Formidable um, it's super easy. You just put in what kind of questions you want, which of these are required. You can even have some secret questions that only staff will see. Um, we have one private question um, about why are you rehoming your pet and people are very honest. Um, it's really helpful for us to then, you know, circle back and have a kind of uh, and offer all kinds of services to them. Um, and they can attach an image, which is very important to have that visual component. Once someone hits that submit button, two things happen. Um, a notification goes out to the staff members that manage the program and it automatically generates a draft blog post with the information that was submitted and, attached, and attaches a category, no place like home. And that's pretty much it. So staff reviews the blog post. Most of the time it 
it's good to go. They basically just add a little tag, cat, dog, small animal, so that the dog people don't have to scroll through the cats and vice versa. And then it's good to go. They hit publish. It shows up on our website. Um, so that's super easy. Um, a lot of times, folks feel like they're maybe not, that might not be the right solution for them. It's just too technical. There are a lot of other options. There are other WordPress plugins. Um, Humane Society of Sonoma uses a plugin called Access Press. If you use a different content management system, there's different options. Google Forms, anyone who's ever created a survey or a form will be able to pull up a Google Form. Or people could even email that information to you with an attachment. Um, I've also thought that maybe it's helpful for people um, if they already use a shelter software like PetPoint or PetFinder, they could create a custom location and then just list that location. So there's just a lot of ways to make these animals show up on your website. I think my main point is not to let the technical side of a private rehoming program keep you from starting one. Whatever it is that people do, I wanna say there's three guiding principles. It should be visible, just easy to find on the website, accessible, like it should work on different browsers. It should work on mobile, maybe with a screen reader and be client centric. You don't wanna do like an 80 page form that's just very daunting for people to look at. You don't want to introduce all these accidental barriers. Um, and you know, if a lot of folks, again, if they say we're not ready, we don't have the time, the staff, the expertise, the capacity, um, I think Mandy can talk a little bit about um, her home to home program and how your shelter could um, sign on to that program. Well, thanks, Karina. That was a really nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we um, at our shelter, when we started the home to home program, um, it was really successful. And I think that that you guys share the same level of pride that we shared when we like did our program and we we're like, oh my gosh, this is a really, this is really amazing. Um, so we had a funder provide us with some support to take it nationally. So we have 17 shelters currently on. Yesterday we had seven join requests come in. It's been crazy this, this time right now. People are really recognizing the importance of offering a rehoming site. Um, so when you join um, Home to Home, you get your own customized Home to Home website that's tied into your Facebook page. So whenever you uh, community member is interested in posting their pet, they would post it and it's all connected to your organization. Um, and then a staff person would review it, approve it, and it would go up onto the site and onto to Facebook. Um, that we have built in features that track data. So there's not the back end of having to keep a separate Excel spreadsheet. Um, and then we also really want to share with people that just having a rehoming program. So, you know, obviously we think home to home is amazing, but Marin Humane is a perfect example of a shelter um, that really just did it on their own. And I think it's great. Um, so I'm, I'm including a slide that gives you a breakdown of how you can evaluate the savings. So by taking the number of owner surrenders you have in a shelter in a year, so we'll just say 500, and the average reduction in owner surrenders is 25%. That's 125 animals that would never enter your building. And if you look at your intake costs, your vaccine, your medical personnel, um, your daily costs just to keep an animal in your building, what is that amount? So for this little example, we're going to say it's $25 um, to intake an animal and expense and it's $12 a day, 10 days, so it's $120. Um, by the time you've completed a year, you've saved $18,000 and you're able to either Really, if you reframe your thinking and you think our primary job is to keep animals out of the shelter and into homes, then that savings could be put more towards programs like you guys were talking about, your um, helpline or um, medical behavior, any of the, the programs. Um, so it's just, a, I think for shelters, it's just kind of switching that thinking a little bit that we don't need to put all our resources in the box of a shelter. Let's look at how we divert them outside the shelter. And then um, I have another slide that just shows that you what the custom websites look like and information on how to join. Um, thanks to Maddie's fund, we are able to onboard shelters for free right now. Um, so it's a simple process to, to join the program. 
that's my whole that's my whole spiel i think um well i wanted to say thank you so much and to be completely open and honest with everyone we are pre-recording this <laughs> and but in just a sh few short moments we'll be starting our q a and the q a will be moderated by dr sarah pisano so thank you karina thank you carrie for um joining me on this uh, really fun webinar. It's been great to meet you guys. And thank you so much for all you're doing to help animals. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Thanks for attending. And thanks to this amazing panel. This is my absolute favorite topic. So I'm glad I get to ask all these burning questions. And Mandy, um, I want to start off with question number one people ask me as you know i'm your number one fan so i'm always trying to get shelters signed up for home to home and the very first question asked and somebody asked it in the chat is what are the fees because in the presentation you said it was free and when they looked up um home to home there were fees so can you talk about the fees right now and what's in the plan with your kickstarter campaign Yes. So um, to join Home to Home, it's usually there's an onboarding fee. Um, and, and honestly, I forgot how much the onboarding fee is because Maddie's Fund has been covering that Lovely. fee. Yes. Thank you, Maddie's. And um, but the yearly fee is around $300 to keep the program um, up and going. And when you take into consideration that we're providing the platform, so it's really quite easy for you to manage and um, it does represent a significant savings to, to the shelter. Uh, right now, today actually, we launched a Kickstarter to be able to fundraise so the onboarding process would be easier, data tracking and the ease and ability for the shelters to manage the program all is increased. Um, so right now we're hoping that people throughout the nation will go on and make a pledge to help the Kickstarter uh, reach our goal so that we can continue to grow this program and get it into as many shelters as possible. Our goal is to help as many animals and shelters as possible in the nation. And Mandy, for those old geezers on the, on the uh, meeting today, like me, um, can you just give us a couple of sentences about Kickstarter and how it's different than other fundraising platforms? Just Tell us how that works, because I know in an uh, email plea, you asked us to, even if you donated a dollar, so can you just give us maybe a two sentence explanation about what Kickstarter is? Yeah, so Kickstarter is a platform where people who have innovative ideas, business concepts can do a profile and then they put it out there. The trick is, is that you only have 30 days and you have 30 days to raise whatever amount of money you're seeking. We're seeking 150,000 and we have 30 days to do that. But the, the programs or the, pla or the, um, the um, projects, sorry, forgetting the word, projects that get the most traction right from the beginning are actually promoted by Kickstarter. So they're gonna go into their newsletters nationally, they're gonna be on their homepage. So the more that we can get people giving even a dollar, really it's about people, the number of people rather than the number of dollars raised will help bring this nationally, which I think that, I mean, I know selfishly, like we want to get this to be um, out there and get the money to be able to upgrade the site. But it also brings a lot of awareness towards animal welfare by just having a project like this in the forefront. Great. And I'll put the you. I'll put the link in the um, in the notes or the chat area so that it's there. Okay. If that's okay. Yes. And if um, I don't know if Lena or Patricia want to take this question about technology for older people, perhaps low income families. Um, do you worry that technology could be a barrier and how do you help people overcome that? Or do you see that as a barrier? That was a great question. So um, I can definitely answer that since I, um, you know, um, made sure, implemented the program on Marine Humane's website. Uh, maybe Patricia can talk a little bit more about the um, experience of the people who submit 
um, the profiles. Um, for the shelter, if your website is was created after 1995, you have some sort of blog option that you can run, right? There's some kind of plugin, some kind of blog where you can post these animals profiles. So um, it is possible that there's a barrier for the shelter in terms of uh, you know, lack of expertise and technical knowledge, but I think that's where Mandy's home to home program comes in that takes that burden right off. Um, in regards to the folks who are trying to rehome the animals or try to adopt the animals, they're already usually on our website. The folks who are looking to adopt animals, they're already browsing our adoptions listings. As for how to submit your profile, we're trying to make that as simple as possible. Um, you know, it's so easy to find on our website. Um, you can really, you trip over that link to submit your rehoming profile um, in all relevant places. And so it's really just a simple form. You click on that, submit my profile for rehoming. You answer a few simple questions and, um, if there's any kind of issues with the submission, Patricia will reach out and, and follow up and walk them through it. If there's something wrong with the image, um, I think Patricia sometimes helps create um, a, a collage or something for them. So um, Patricia, is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of technical challenges? Um, you know, the whole time that I've been working on it, I haven't had anybody say that it was difficult. Uh, there's maybe one, time that I had someone ask me if I could help someone and I did reach out to that person. I called them and emailed them but never heard a response so I couldn't go through with it. But that's in the whole year that I've been working on the program, I hadn't had anybody uh, say that it was difficult or they didn't understand. And, and Dr. And Pisano, can I uh, can I just ask a follow up to that, Mandy, and maybe you can answer this. Like because the platform you're posting the information right that that owner is giving you and they can get that to you however they want or can but what if somebody they don't have they have a flip phone and they have um they can go to the library and use email so is there a way that they can communicate with the person who may be interested in adopting is there a way that can be done through email mandy do you want to answer that well, and I just wanted to address the original question because um, our our home to home program that we run at our shelter, um, we are in a rural community, so we do see a lot of low income or um, elderly individuals that may not be very tech savvy. And during normal times, when we actually can, you know, hug people and be with people, we um, would invite people in to use one of our computers to up to load their site. Um, and then we also have the ability that we can um, just have them write out the information and then we can create it um, or if they have a picture, we can upload it. So there are ways to still communicate and work with the community to get the information out. And at least in the home to home site, um, they are able to contact primarily through email. But if we know that someone on our t on in our community doesn't have email, we will get their phone number and then we put our we have a helpline. So our helpline takes the that call or the interested parties. And when they get the email, they then forward them the phone number of that person. Great. Awesome. Carrie, how about um, do you think, or in your program, Evren, do you feel like this program can be managed successfully by volunteers? Oh, definitely. Um, and just to kind of piggyback on the question she just asked too is, for us, if somebody, it hasn't happened, but if some, it's so simple to do that we could just fill it out for someone and put the post on the website. Um, and, and yes, volunteers definitely can do it. We were just a little nervous in the beginning just because we hadn't done it and what it would encompass to do. So we didn't make this a volunteer type position, but 100% they can easily do that. And Mandy, can you speak to the common question? Well, you're, are you going to post an intact pet and are you going to require spay neuter? Can you speak to that and as it relates maybe to open adoptions? Okay, um, so for um, us as, so keeping in mind that when I talk, it's hard because I'm talking as a representative, representative of 17 shelters that are part of Home to Home. So when I say our program, I mean that our shelter, the way we manage the Home to Home program at our shelter. 
Um, we don't put any barriers to rehoming because frankly, when you put a barrier up to spay and neuter, that could cost somebody easily $300 that they don't have. And it just guarantees that the pet is gonna end up in your, in your shelter. So what we do is, as one of the questions that we ask, is your pet spayed or neutered? But we don't say they can't do anything, right? So when they say that it isn't um, altered, then my person would call them or email them and offer that we have programs that can help get their pet um, spayed or neutered and that we have a higher success rate in rehoming with animals that are. And either they take advantage of that or we follow up with the person that it was, uh, the animal was rehomed to. We have extremely high success rate of getting them altered post, um, post uh, rehoming. But barriers, really, it, it's, you have to ask yourself why you're doing a program like this. And if you're doing it to keep animals out of your shelter and to support and empower your community members, then you need to be really open about it. If you're going to put barriers up, then your program's not gonna be very successful because you're literally driving people to bring their animals to you. And I know that Carrie and Karina have feelings about this because we talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Carrie, do you wanna comment on that? So I, I agree um, with Mandy regarding the barriers. I, I really believe you make the least amount of restrictions on the program. You can always go back and tighten it up. Um, we chose a little bit differently regarding the spay neuter, um, and it's mainly maybe because we well we have a low cost spay neuter clinic. So, um, but as she said that, Mandy said that I kind of want to go back and make sure our posts don't say you have to have it altered because what I prefer and what we should prefer is opening up that dialogue. So right now, I think it does say it's required um, and we'll reach out to the people and provide low cost spay neuter um, services at no cost if they need it to get it done. Um, but I, I am going to go back because she's right. You do not want to have barriers and, and starting out by saying to someone, you have to do this is going to turn people off um, versus let's reach out to them and say, hey, we'd like to provide, you know, this service. And I'm so happy to hear that, Carrie. It's all about access, right? So Mandy, back to you. The liability question is asked of me a lot when I talk about home to home. There's um, people in the audience that are asking about it. They have a couple of questions around that. Are people on, do you feel that people are honest? Like, are they going to have you post an animal that perhaps bit, but they don't want to say anything? Do you find that people are honest is the first question. And then two, what is the liability for a program like either of yours or your 17 shelters that are now doing home to home? So can you speak to those issues? Yes, so in general liability, as long as the shelter follows the uh, protocols where they're simply acting as a platform, they're providing their community with a service and they don't get involved in vetting potential owners, they don't get involved in just any, any kind of discrimination like, um, you know, I think that person's a, a drug abuser, so I'm not going to post their pet, you know, things like that. If you're even Steven, um, on our team, we tell people that if you don't like a post, you email back and say, I think you might get shamed by leading with this. You could do this, and then we get an email back approving the change so that we know that we aren't taking over and, um, controlling it. So as long as the team stays out of it, they don't inject themselves, they're not doing drive-bys, you know, all the crazy stuff that can happen, your shelter is pretty safe because of it. I mean, we can't tell you you're not going to get sued because we can, anybody can get sued at any moment, but we've been running it for four years. No one's ever had uh, any issues. The other side of it, and, and this is a question we get a lot, is the honesty question. And I think that we have been somewhat skewed. Um, media and everything has skewed us to kind of assume that people are dishonest and that we, we have to make sure it doesn't happen. But we, we don't see that. And then, and the funny part is, is that we see almost like overly honest. Actually, I think that Carrie and Karina and I are talking about this, that people yeah, are, yeah, they're like, yeah, overly honest about it. And some shelters that I think it's up to the shelter. So for us, if somebody says, we, we one time we had this um, German Shepherd and it had been trained for 
I don't know, it's one of those Schlitz dogs or the Germany dogs, right? And someone bought this dog to make it a family pet and it was not doing well in the home and it had had behavior issues. And what we said was, as long as you're honest in your post and you tell us, ev you put in there everything you've told us, then we'll put it on the site because it's up to the owner. They are, they've read it all. But if they refuse to share all the details and be honest about it, we won't post their pet. But some and shelters choose not to post those animals. Right, exactly. And then, so again, just to wrap up the liability, so you don't have any, the people who are posting, the owners, they don't sign anything um, for to become part of this program? Or no, so anytime that when you're using the Home to Home program, when you are searching out a pet or you post a pet, you have a list of uh, check boxes that okay. you have to check that just says that, you know, you're not going to hold the shelter or home to home liable, that you know that we aren't vetting these people, you are yada, yada, yada. And right yeah. now we've added the COVID um, disclaimer that just tells them that they need to follow CDC and the re government regulations for their st state and federal for meeting and greeting people. And another question from the audience tied into that and Carrie, I'll let you go. When I just want to ask a follow up is if an owner is one of those things or stipulations is that they cannot charge for the rehoming because one of the questions is, does an owner charge? Mm -hmm. So we um, don't put anything about a fee and no one has ever put a fee. We really try to simplify it. Um, I know Mandy, um, she and I talked about that. So we, you know, again, we may go back and actually put something that says you can't offer a fee. We've not had one person um, say they want to. But if you don't mind, I'd like to just add a little bit more to the last question because I think it's really important. Sure. The thing about people being honest, well, I agree with Mandy, I, and we, you know, assume good intentions, but the bottom line is how is this any different than if someone surrenders a, an animal to the shelter? They're going to say the same, same thing. So that's number one. In regards, in regards to liability, we are not lawyers, of course, and of course, anybody can sue anybody, but on our site, we clearly say this is not, um, you know, we've not met this animal. This is between you and the Per, the potential home. And I view it as no different than if someone puts an ad in the newspaper, you know, looking, looking for someone. We're, we're providing this platform um, as a way to, um, you know, get, get homes for animals. So again, we're not lawyers. We're not, I mean, anyone can sue anybody, but if you kind of take that perspective, um, it's just a, you know, if you post something at a, a, a store that you're looking for, you know, rehoming an animal is a store liable? Probably not, so. Right, I think a lot of shelters feel um, very responsible and that they're almost like the adoption police, like they need to make sure all of these things are in place, not realizing like most people get their animals other places. So when yep. we make this a partnership and easy, so that's why I love your programs. Um, so Mandy, in the 17 shelters, and I know they all have different start dates and you have, so your data is rolling in. But one of the questions was, has this been more successful for dogs or cats? Do you see a difference? Are more of one or the other posted? What's your take on that at this point? We do see um, a little bit more dogs being posted than cats. Mm -hmm. Though right now I can tell you that in the increase that we've had, um, yeah, since uh, COVID, we have seen an increase in cats. But the other thing that's kind of cool too is that we only take in dogs and cats. So our home to home program has had iguanas, pigs, horses, um, all sorts of yeah. animals, a tarantula. We had a, we had a tarantula too. I thought I was gonna beat you on that one. Yeah, we had uh -huh. adopted. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Okay, and Carrie, what about your program? Any difference between dogs or cats? Or um, I more dogs, um, but and um, I'm not sure sure why why that is. Um, and Patricia can kind of answer that. But looking at it, I, I'm pretty sure it's more dogs than cats. Is that correct, Patricia? She might have to unmute herself. Yeah, there have been more dogs adopted than cats and again i don't know why that would be either yeah we do get a lot of cats listed yeah but the dogs seem to be 
adopted quicker. Mm -hmm. and right, and Patricia, remind me again when your program started, I'm sorry. It started in, if it wasn't February 2019 or? Yeah, we started our first post was December actually 2018, yeah. um, but we're using the data for all of 2019. Okay, so Patricia, since the start of your program, have you seen your trends increase? Are more people aware of it? Can you talk about your trends and how you're getting the word out, how you're increasing those numbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, since the start of the program, we have seen a lot more listings. I mean, I want to say that we saw a big jump in 2018 and not only that, but more animals are getting rehomed rather than surrendered to the shelter. Um, so great. Mm -hmm. So, and I think having it on our website is really helpful. Also, what we're trying to do is um, publicize it at the shelter when people leave and they don't find the animal they see. You know, we have our volunteers mention that we do have this private rehoming program where they can view other animals and possibly find the animal that they're specifically looking for. Perfect, yes, I love it, okay. So actually, let's see, Patricia, I don't know if it would be Patricia or Karina, one of the questions is like, this is a rehoming for pet owners, but somebody is wondering, did you also see a decrease in your stray intake that maybe was because you have a resource for owners? If you did see a, a decrease also in your stray intake? in 2019? Um, I don't know, Carrie, maybe. Um, I can answer. <laughs> we, um, so the, the stray hasn't changed. Our surrender um, has significantly gone down, significantly. Right. Now, we've done a few different things. This is one tool that we have used. Um, we're providing more, as I said in the um, podcast, is that we, you know, it's it's a, a pillar of what of our program. So we provide a lot the access to behavior and training and medical stuff, um, but we have seen a significant decrease in animals being surrendered. Um, and I'm going to say it's because of this. Um, I think there's quite a few, you know, quite a few things we've done, but this is one of them. Amazing. I love it. I'm a super fan. Yeah. One of the uh, questions, Mandy, is if somebody signs up for Home to Home, can you talk about the time it takes to implement it? Uh, right now, um, it's, I think, about a month. And the only reason is, is because we've had more join requests than ever before. Um, and so we're trying to keep up um, with the, the program. The nice thing is, is that once you're on board, you have this, this great option. Um, I feel really, really lucky that we had this program for a while when all of this went down because we were able to just tell people, it, it's really nice to not have, I know that all of us are in the same boat where we're like, we wanna help you, but we can't right now. And to be able to have a program like this where you can just say, you know what, um, I, I can't help you this way, but I can help you this way. Um, so yeah, it does take a little bit right now, but we're doing our best to, to stay on top of it. Amazing, so let's go around and Karina, why don't you start, um, do you have any, closing comments you want to share with the audience? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's definitely worth a try. Um, however you want to implement it or sign on, you know, with Mandy's program. It's just been amazing to see um, just the, like uh, the tarantula, the, um, the cockatiels, like all these animals that never had to go come into the shelter and get super stressed out, just immediately find homes. Um, it's just very heartwarming and it's been, easy to manage, easy to implement. And um, people are really honest, as I said earlier, um, sometimes surprisingly so. I'm like, really, you're going to put that in the description for your pet? <laughs> um, but it's, it's really um, heartening to see. And I think that's where it's going, especially right now. Um, in terms of earlier, real quick, how we're getting the word out, especially right now um, that our adoptions are temporarily suspended. We have a big little box um, on top of the adoptable animals about adoptions being suspended and redirecting people to our private rehoming program. And the, um, 
those page views are just through the roof, mostly because there just aren't that many adoptable animals to look at. Um, so I think people just really want to still get their, Hallelujah. Um, their fix of adoptable animals. So it's, it's, this is the time to do it. Um, I would really encourage folks to jump in and give it a chance. Yes. Patricia, what about you? Any closing comments? Um, I think it's a great program overall. I'm really happy that we've seen an increase of animals being rehomed. Um, it's also really heartwarming when people decide to keep their animals and you know, they make things work out. And I'm just glad that we're able to provide so many resources to uh, people looking to rehome their pets in terms of speaking to behaviorists or the low income spay neuter clinic um, or you know, just even the financial side of it, we're able to help with that. So it's a great program. And I think it's, it would be great if other shelters could start doing the same thing. Makes me weep. Carrie, what about you? I mean, in a good way, like it's yeah. just. I'm well, I'm, I'm the cheerleader of this program. So my, my kind of my two things to say is don't be scared. It's really simple um, to do. Uh, and don't make a lot of um, roadblocks for people. You can always add those things that may come up later on. So one of the things we were concerned about is, um, do we let rescues post on this? Do we tell people that they can only post if they're in a certain radius, you know? So for us, is someone from LA gonna post, you know, and we're eight hours away? And we've, none of those things have come up. Um, and I'm, I'm personally not opposed to the idea of rescue groups posting. I mean, these animals all need homes, but that is my advice. Do not set up a lot of restrictions. You can add those later if things come up, but, but don't worry about all that stuff. So, and just try it. You have nothing to lose. You really don't. Right. Mandy, go ahead. What are your closing comments? Well, one of the things that I love, and I'm, I don't know, I'm a sharer, just saying, like, I really believe in collaboration and sharing, and I really loved getting to know you wonderful folks at Marin Humane. Um, but our, when we started the program, um, we sent postcards out about the program to all the feed stores. We sent it to all the veterinary clinics. We sent it stacks of them to area animal shelters next to us that uh, we knew would, would could refer people to our program, um, but couldn't necessarily have the resources to manage it. Um, and then we have Spokane, uh, or excuse me, Scraps, which is the regional shelter in um, Spokane, just joined the program. And what's nice is that you have, like just in my little area, I have five shelters all recommending the use of the home-to-home -home program for owner surrenders, plus all the area vets. But now that Scraps is on, we have a networking feature. So people in Spokane that are an hour and a half from us can search for a pet there and then expand their region to see 100 miles or something. And our animals at our shelter will show up. So even though our site is not, um, we really feel strongly that these programs should be managed at a shelter level because your community members are already coming to you for these services. But by using it, it does have this networking effect as well. So I would encourage anyone to do it. I think it's, I, well, people that know me on this, pot, on this webinar know that I'm a huge believer in community collaboration. And when you believe in people, they really do step up um, and that this can be so successful and really heartwarming and changes your view of your community when you're really working and talking to them. So I encourage you to do it. Amen, sister. Well, I'm honored to be on this Brady Bunch box with you all. <laughs> and if we did get to all the questions, to my knowledge, but if you have additional questions and you're listening, please join us at Maddie's Pet Forum. And in the webcast section, you can ask your questions. All of us um, that you're looking at right now have been so deeply touched by Maddie's support and funding. And so much of this could have happened without Maddie's and we are eternally grateful. We are oozing gratitude. And if there's one thing in just the midst of this horrific pandemic that we can say is a silver lining, it's home to home, it's your rehoming programs, it's community-based foster care. To truly embrace fear-free sheltering means keeping animals out of shelters. So thank you so much for listening, everybody. And thanks for everybody for this amazing, all of you at Marin and 
Mandy, Evans, thank you for this amazing presentation today. We appreciate you all. Thank you, Sarah. Be safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.